Um, welcome back. And we are moving into our next panel, um, and that's on SIB, which is Special Immigrant Visa. And I see in the chat box that someone, people have already, already have questions on this issue. So I'm going to let uh, our panelists, uh, Spurjmi and Margaret, take it away. Oh, and I'm sorry, and Miriam too. We, uh, so thank you so much. And there's lots of questions. So just jump right in. Okay, um, I'll, I'll get started. Um, we have a slideshow, so I'll pull that up. Hold on. And I tried to find a picture of an Afghan passport, but I couldn't. So we're stuck with the United Arab Emirates. Sorry about that. Okay, let's see. Can everyone see the slides? Are the slides visible to folks? Okay, great. Yeah. All right, so our, our topic is uh, special immigrant visas. Are they still happening? Or have they gone the way of humanitarian parole? <laughs> um, they are still happening. So that's the good news. Um, and I think we left Miriam off here. I apologize for that. Okay, so this is what we're gonna go through. Um, I will tell you that we don't have enough time to go into all the details that are on the slides. I basically put together a slide deck for people participating in this to use as a reference after the presentation. So we will give you copies of these. You don't need to write anything down. You're gonna have copies, um, but we are not gonna go into, there's too much detail. These are basically slides designed for an attorney to use as a reference when handling a case, but we're not gonna go over everything. So don't panic in the chat. Don't tell me you have to write everything down. You're gonna get copies. You don't have to write everything down. And there's also too much information on some of the slides because it's checklist material for lawyers to use later. We do have a couple of references that I think will be helpful. Um, one, I'm a big fan of IRAP, the International Refugee Assistance Project. They're really great. They have wonderful websites. They have everything you need to know if you're handling an SIV case, checklists, explanations for clients. Uh, if you don't understand something, you can go there and all will be revealed. Um, the State Department, believe it or not, also has really good information on their website. Uh, so we have a reference to that. Um, they tend to be not quite as helpful as IRAP's information, um, but it's still extremely good information. And then just for fun, you can read what the State Department is telling Congress about the SIV programs. Um, I think you could probably just skim the executive summary on that thing, but um, it's interesting to see the historical uh, mess that was created by this program. Oh, and I should just say as an overarching editorial comment that this is one of the worst designed programs that I have ever seen. Um, it has all the hallmarks of good intentions by Congress with completely no concept of how the government works. And so the program was not designed to actually work very well. You can tell that by the fact that there's no stakeholder that owns the program. It's basically divided between three different cabinet level agencies, not a single one of which owns, actually owns the program. So it's split responsibility with Department of Defense, State Department and Department of Homeland Security. And there's nobody important in charge of it. Um, you can't name the task person you know, the famous person that's in charge of the special immigrant program, because there isn't one. In fact, from what I can tell, nobody's really in charge of it. And that explains a lot of the chaos and the confusion, but it's still happening. So let's let it happen. Um, a few things you should know about is there's different programs. So there's a program that was created in 2006 that still exists, a program created in 2009 that still exists. There were updates and changes to the programs made multiple times over many years. And sometimes they're not easy to find because Congress likes to put a lot of the changes in the National Defense Authorization Act, which often results in um, non-transparent changes to the law. They don't, get the, they don't get codified in like eight United States code somewhere. They're just like in a note. Uh, and so it can be hard to find a lot of the changes when they're in the NDAA. 
but the NDA is a convenient place to dump things because it doesn't, it's a must pass bill. Nobody ever votes against the NDAA except one or two people in Congress. Um, and it's kind of the go-to piece of legislation. If you don't think you can get bipartisan support, you just throw it in the NDAA and it goes through. Um, and so they've made a lot of changes to the special um, immigrant visa programs for Iraq and Afghanistan by way of the NDAA, because it's just a lot easier. Um, you just stick it on the bill and it goes through. Okay, my two co-panelists, did you want to comment on any of this so far? I know you probably have your own thoughts. Just following through, go ahead. Okay, um, now we will go to more of the substance. Okay, so the starfish story. All right, I like to start this off by encouraging lawyers to think of the old Lauren Isley story. There's a little girl on the beach and she's throwing the starfish back into the sea and there's thousands and thousands of starfish on the beach. And some older guy comes by and says to her, little girl, what are you doing? This is a waste of your time. You know, you can't possibly save all these starfish. You know, there's just thousands of them. Um, you know, what does this mean to, you know, pick up one at a time? You know, this is a waste of your time. You should just let them all die. Um, and she picks up a starfish in front of him and throws it back into the sea. And she said, well, it made a difference for that one, didn't it? You know, so what we're doing here with the SIV program is we're basically saving starfish. You know, there's just thousands of people out there who are dying literally, and you just got to try to save as many as you can. And that's what the SIV program is all about. So you're not going to save everybody though. All right. So what is it? It's a type of visa available to Afghans who are employed by or on behalf of the US government, or in some cases for other people. Um, but somehow there's a US government interest involved in the case. And the program originally began in 2006 with 50 visas a year. Uh, what a joke. Um, and then it was expanded in Iraq in 2008. And then they created a broad Afghan program in 2009. And then in 2021, hopefully, hopefully just before the evacuation, Congress updated the statutes to expand the eligibility significantly. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so again, there's two sections, 602B and 1059. And you have to make sure you know which one your person's applying under. Some people are applying under both. The key thing to note is that 1059 has hardly any visas per fiscal year. Um, 50 per fiscal year, With they're talking about changing. So there's some changes to that, but that, that one is um, a pretty tiny program and it's been historically backlogged. Most people are coming in under 602. And this is the one where the deadline was extended recently. It's the most common one. Um, most recent data shows that about 38,000 of these were pending, which is a lot, but it's a lot less than the humanitarian parole applications that were pending. Um, there is a complicated process, which we'll go into about how to get one. Um, so this is just to give you some idea of the numbers. Um, and people who qualify for SIVs can also apply for visas for their spouse. Only one spouse, though, if they have more than one, they can only only one. And unmarried children under the age of 21. Okay, my fellow panelists, comments? Any comments? Yeah, so I, when I was on the military bases, um, one of the most common questions was pertaining to, to, to spouses. Um, and that issue came up and, and you're gonna see that often. So maybe they got evacuated with uh, the second spouse and now they wanna bring in the first spouse. Um, not gonna happen um, because as we all know, polygamy is not allowed. Um, right. The sad story that we heard was brought the second spouse with the kids and the person wants to bring the children of the first spouse under 21 and not married. Uh, and yes, they can. Uh, but the spouse is left. And for me, there's a moral story behind that. So you have to kind of be careful how you navigate that. You take away the children from the first wife and leave the first wife behind, unfortunately. So some of those stories that just get really interwined. Yeah, so the, the other spouse could try to access a refugee program. I mean, they, they would be el the person would be eligible for that, but obviously that's gonna take years. Or if the child turns 21 and becomes yeah. a citizen, but that takes years. I personally, I'm a child of refugees in the 80s and that's exactly what happened with my mother. My, my siblings and I came with my dad and his second wife and my mom was left behind and when my brother turned 21 became citizen, brought my mom over. So 
Yeah, so these stories, these stories okay. decades later still come, but yeah, that's one way they could do it. Yep, uh, really pretty sad stories, but I'm glad you made that comment though, because that is a pretty common scenario. Uh, so key thing to know is that July 30th, 2021, uh, Congress changed the law to make it easier for people to qualify for SIVs. So you do want to make sure you're operating on the latest information and not old handouts that sit, that say the old rules. Uh, so they changed the requirement for employment from two years to one year that got reduced. Um, they allow posthumous applications by spouses and children. So previously, if the principal applicant died, the spouse and kids were just out of luck, and now they're not. Um, in fact, there's a whole bunch of people that are now eligible for SIVs who thought they weren't eligible before, and they got previously told they weren't eligible. And now, you know, there's actually thousands and thousands of them who are now eligible because of that. Um, there's an appeal process that's easier, easier requirements for proof of qualifying through ISAF employment. Um, the medical exams don't have to be done overseas before you come here. You can come here without your medical and complete it when you get here. That had been a big problem with a lot of folks. Um, they kicked more visas into the Afghan program and allowed visas from the Iraqi program to be used in the 1059 program because the Iraqis have not been utilizing all the visas available to them recently. Um, so anyway, those are pretty important changes that you should just be aware of. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to my fellow panelists to talk about what she saw on the military bases in addition to the more than one spouse problem. There were a lot of issues with the Afghans who got paroled in and ended up on the military bases. Thank you, Margaret. So um, some of the issues that we saw were um, first getting the HR letter, um, getting the, so when we were on the bases, depending on what stage they were. So some people had completed everything. They had completed them. They hadn't completed the medical examination. Um, they were on these bases so they could, if they had completed a full process, but we're waiting for the visa to be issued, then they can file the I-485. Uh, and Margaret will get into the different stages of it in, uh, shortly. Uh, the biggest challenge was first getting the HR letter, confirming that that person actually worked for a qualifying entity. Um, the other thing was, and we'll get into it, is subcontractors, if you work, you work as a subcontractor for a certain entity, it may not make you eligible for SIV. And then the largest portion was um, the um, COM approval, which it takes an extensive amount of time. Uh, Margaret, would you know, so on some of these bases that I was on, it was very hush-hush um, for 001 group, 002 groups and KPF, the uh, host frontier province group. They, there was some person that they could get the calm letter really fast. Can you, can you read on that? Do you know any information? I wasn't able to get it on the basis, but they were able to get their letters pretty quick. Yeah, um, I mean, some of this I think is classified, so they don't, that's why it was quote hush hush. Um, but there are people that worked in certain, for certain companies or certain groups where it's just really easy to get a calm letter, you know. Yeah, I mean, particular it, basis, it's getting hundreds and hundreds of them fairly quickly. So yeah, it just depends. You know, it's one of those things where if you if you're you work for somebody who's still around and cares, you can get a comm letter really fast. Um, you worked for David Petraeus, you know, you're going to get your comm letter really fast. Um, the other challenge, again, what I saw in the basis was. Um, the, you know, they're asking for children over 21 or, or married, so they necessarily were not qualified. One of the common theme I saw on the basis, and I know some of my, you know, other panelists have been to the basis is, the idea was to get one person in and then that person would get everybody else in, the rest of the family, and then particularly in the SIV process. So some of the bases that I went, there were clusters of certain groups that work for entities. The process was streamlined for them to get the calm approval, but overall, the calm approval seems to be the the largest gap that we're seeing. It is, and there's some people that are having a heck of a time getting calm approval because whoever they worked for, it was ten years ago, and they don't can't find anybody, or the company went out of business, or got bought out by somebody else, or didn't keep good records. Um, there's also a scandal with a Navy officer who was giving out. Um, fake letters, false letters. He was taking bribes and they caught him like immediately. I don't think anybody actually made it to the US with one of his letters, but 
you know, they had to go, there was a security scare because of that. I guess they didn't, you know, they stopped processing to try to figure out how big the problem was and how many people might have gotten through and so forth and so on. So there have been huge glitches with that. And I don't think anybody anticipated that a US military officer would be giving out fake letters. It kind of reminded me of saw fraud, special agricultural <laughs> worker fraud back in the 80s. I guess I'm old, but you know, back then people would get fake letters from a farmer saying they had worked on a farm for three months. And this Navy officer was had filed for bankruptcy. And so I guess he needed some money. And he was handing out comm letters, you know, for a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars or whatever. And he had actually been deployed in Afghanistan. So, you know, he had the credentials to write letters for people, but he was asking for money and he apparently didn't know the people. Um, the other sad part about it was that some of the people apparently legitimately qualified for SIV, but they weren't able to get a hold of any of their supervisors because they had disappeared. And so they were paying this guy to give them letters because they couldn't find their supervisor. So that was kind of another wrinkle on it. So Margaret, do we want to go through like like what are the different steps of, of yeah a we're going to do that um however keep in mind folks we don't have a lot of time you could spend a whole day seminar on how to do an siv so i am going to give you the slides so don't panic if there's a, too much information okay because you'll be able to look at this later so i just want to give you broad brush overview appropriate for the seminar today so section 602 you have to be a citizen of Afghanistan. You have to have been employed in Afghanistan for at least one year and have, has to have been by the US government or by a contractor with funding from the government or with ISAF. And you must have provided faithful and valuable service. That means you can't have um, been a secret Taliban you know, person who was working against the government of the United States or the government of Afghanistan. And you're supposed to have an ongoing serious threat um, so you do have to say that you feel like you'll be threatened if you don't get to the United States. Um, and then there are people who applied under the old rules long time ago, and you have to check those cases really carefully because they might have gotten denied, but now they're eligible again, and so they can reapply now. Um, 1059, very different. This is only for interpreters and translators. And they have to be a citizen of Afghanistan, work directly with the US Armed Forces or the Chief of Mission for at least 12 months. And in this case, um, they need a recommendation letter from a general or a flag officer. Uh, that's a little bit weird compared to the other one. Uh, but this one's actually easy to qualify for if you meet these requirements. It's, it's a little bit easier, for, at least in my experience, to handle these cases um, than to handle the regular ones. Okay, so this is just an overseas general process and you, there still are folks overseas. So this is important to understand. So um, if the person files the application, they file a COM application, hopefully they get it approved. After they get the COM application completed and it gets approved, then they file an I-360 petition with USCIS. And once USCIS approves the I-360, they notify them what consulate they want to process at, and then they do a DS-260, one for each family member that's got to be filled out online, SEAC system, consular electronic application system or center. Um, and then they're going to have an interview, and a legal representative is allowed to go to the interview with them, which is unusual. Most of the time, immigrant visa applicants don't have a lawyer with them, but if you want to fly to the foreign country and go to the interview, you're allowed to do that. Uh, and then they go through security checks. This usually results in a really long period of delay. Um, people always ask me, why does it take so long? It doesn't actually take long because the security checks themselves take long. It takes long because there's nobody doing the checks. You know, um, They don't have enough people doing the checks, so they just hold people up. Um, it's not a function of the fact that the US government actually, once the button gets pushed, it's really fast to do a security check, but nobody's pushing the button. And then they enter the United States. Once they get the visa, they get on a plane, they come to the US, and they're going to be lawful permanent residents at that point um, when they enter the country and they're eligible for certain benefits. Okay, um, timing and location. So this is just to give you a big picture view of how long it's taking. It's a long process. Um, the average processing time for the COM application 
406 days. That's crazy. Okay. Now it's sped up recently with some groups. Um, as my fellow attorney just mentioned earlier, there's some people that are getting those comm approvals really fast, but a lot of people, the, the ordinary people that don't have connections, it's slower. Um, the USCS petitions are really fast. I, USCS is approving those I-360s extremely quickly. Um, and then, of course, they have to do the visa application, and those are supposed to be fast, although recently in Islamabad, it hasn't been terribly quick. Uh, and I think that's more of a function of the staff at Islamabad rather than the fact that the U.S. government can't do it faster. If you were in Frankfurt, you'd probably get processed pretty quickly, but you're in Islamabad. And then the security processing takes a long time. Um, and so this is just to give you a general idea for people outside the U.S. Okay, and then 1059 process, they do a USCS petition directly. There's no comm approval required. Then they do the visa application, the interview, the security checks, um, so forth. Okay, so timing, um, the government mandated that they have to process these cases quickly, but as we talked about earlier in the panel on legislation, Congress mandates all kinds of things that the government doesn't do. And so Congress mandated a processing time and they're not complying with it, but you know, that's the way the US government works these days. Okay, so applying for chief emission approval. This is a really big deal. And this is kind of the crux of the process in many cases. Um, so you have to get this letter of recommendation and you have to get an HR letter and contract evidence and your statement of threat. And then you have to fill out a form. You have to prove you're really an Afghan and not a Russian or a French or something else. Um, they want to see your badge if it's available. And then, of course, your G28 from your attorney. And you're going to email all this stuff to a special address. And you want to look at the DOS and IRAP websites for the latest information because this is changing regularly. So, okay. Margaret, one of the questions um, I often get, um, and this morning I was on a call with CARE, the C-A-R-E. They were talking, and one of the questions they asked was, how come it takes some people when you're doing the application abroad, um, particularly for the comm letter, why are some expedited faster than others? And the answer I got was um, that is uh, congressionally, congressionally legislated the priority. So if it's two, there's, I think there's five tiers from my understanding. Yeah. And if, if there's five applications for tier five, but there's one application that comes in after for tier one, they'll put the tier one before tier five. Is that accurate? Uh, yeah, I think it's accurate, but it it's frustrating to people that there are some people being treated differently than other people based on who they know, and that's kind of what's going on, really. You know, it's were you somebody that had a connection to somebody more important, or you were in an organization that's considered more important? You know, the people that are being treated the worst right now are the ones that served years and years and years ago for some company that doesn't exist and they just can't get the supporting documents anymore and nobody's really trying to help them. You know, they had that project rabbit, but that sort of seems to be not as effective as they thought it would be. Um, the biggest problem I'm finding is people can't prove the stuff that the government wants them to prove sufficiently. And then there's also individual problems that are recurrent where uh, there's a lot of um, backstabbing going on within the program among different applicants. And people were, I don't know, ratting each other out in order to get ahead of other people. So somebody that wanted to get to the US on an SIV would have a friend, so-called friend that was trying to come to the US on an SIV and they might decide to sabotage their friend's application by claiming that that person was working for the Taliban, even though it wasn't true. And they would put false information out there in order to get ahead of them, you know, try to get ahead of them. And so that's been all, an ongoing problem as well, unfortunately. Um, so we have a question here, Margaret, who is the HR letter for Afghan person or chief of commission? I think there's some confusion because you need both. Yeah, you need both. And I kind of get into that in a minute. So anyway, the qualifying employment, um, you can have multiple employers, you can add periods together. Um, if you don't have a year of employment, you're looking at the P2 refugee program. So you have to have that year. 
Okay, so a letter recommendation is one letter. Okay, it's supposed to be written by the direct senior supervisor who's a US citizen or direct senior supervisor who's not a citizen co-signed by a US citizen responsible for the contract. And I've had cases where it took us like seven or eight months to get this done just because it was such a headache to find the US citizen responsible for the contract. You know, um, it's just really difficult and you have to get them to put the right information into the letter. So if they just write a standard letter, it's not gonna have the right information. They have to put specific things and you have to look at the current guidance from the COM people at State Department to make the letter, make sure the letter has all the required information. It's really heartbreaking when somebody does one of these applications and the letter doesn't have all the right information. So they just deny it because you didn't get that in there. And they will verify the information with the supervisor and with the US citizen who signed it. So that was the, the Navy captain or Navy um, commander who was doing the scam was sending, giving people these US citizen letters. You know, he, he was claiming he was responsible for the contract or he was, he was claiming he was a direct senior supervisor and he was writing these letters for people even though he didn't know them. Um, okay, the HR letter is different. This is the HR representative and this is to verify the employment. And again, you got to put specific information in here and it has to be all the required information or they deny the case. Okay, they want the contract numbers. Um, so lawyers spend a lot of time in these cases digging through government databases looking for contract numbers. This is a headache to get sometimes and getting copies of the contracts can be a headache. Um, statement of threats, there's no set format, you know, you, you're supposed to say, hi, I'm being threatened and try to put some information in. Okay, and then you have to fill out a DS-157 with this particular information and they don't want you to leave any boxes blank. You do have to have evidence of your nationality and um, employee badge and form G-28. And then there's a special email at the National Visa Center that you send it to. So unlike other applications where you have to mail things in, this was all email, it's really nice. You get an automatic reply that the email is received and they will follow up with a case number. Um, and then they forward everything to the com. Um, if you do everything right, you should get an approval. But the common reasons for denial are they claim they can't verify your documents or you were terminated for cause or security screening failure. Um, a lot of times I've seen that if the person put in too much information in the packet, the State Department people don't seem to want to read through carefully and look for ways to approve it. So they'll deny it even though all the required information is in there because they just weren't looking at it hard enough. So it does really help to have an attorney if there's voluminous documentation who can highlight things and have a cover letter that explains how the person qualifies and what exhibits to look at. Um, I, I don't know if you've heard this expression before, but feed the bureaucratic beast, you know? Um, these are people that don't have a lot of time to review these packets and they're not interested in digging through for three hours to look for the relevant information. So if you can put that cover letter on there and highlight, you know, get your yellow highlighter out and put it in the key stuff that they need to see, you're more likely to get a calm approval. Uh, and I have unfortunately seen a fair number of denials where the person actually sent all the information in that was needed for um, getting the case approved, but it, it was 300 pages of material and it was buried somewhere on you know page 244. And so whoever a State Department was looking at the thing didn't notice it and they didn't present their case coherently. So this is where lawyers can come in really handy. Lawyers are oh, good at- Margaret, I had a quick question. In the, prior to the evacuation of the Afghans, um, did you see lawyers really helping do the SIV or most people doing it on their own in Afghanistan versus what's going on now? I saw most people doing it on their own, but I would end up with the tough cases where they got denied because they somebody would say, oh, call her. She knows about SIVs. And I was ending up with all these cases that had been denied. And that's why I know this, because I'd look at the packet they submitted and I go, okay, well, you should have been approved, but you didn't know how to present yourself properly to the US government. Um, the other thing I saw was people would send multiple emails with different pieces 
of the information. So it wasn't all packaged in like one email with a nice cover letter and exhibits and everything. They were sent like 10 different emails. And, you know, one email had document one in it and another email had document two and nobody at the Com approval authority put all these emails together. They just didn't bother with that. They just said, oh, denied. And yeah, why, why I asked that question is, is yeah. this is a whole new world for immigration attorneys. Um, right. And people always ask, well, what was the process before? And the answer was, is most people did it on their own in Afghanistan. Now with the evacuation, people are at different stages right. and attorneys are scrambling to learn it. Um, majority of the attorneys. Yeah, I mean, you're lucky if you get somebody that never submitted anything previously and you can submit a clean package uh, because at least most of what I've seen, they either got approved all on their own by submitting themselves or the thing is a big mess. The file is a big mess. And it's just a huge amount of work to straighten it out. So that's kind of the short version of... Okay, you don't have to copy all this down. I'm going to give this to you. Okay, but these are just my tips for... Um, com application tips. I don't want to go into whole huge details because we don't have a huge amount of time. Okay, so you're going to file form I-360 with USCIS. Um, this is pretty straightforward. You actually file it by email. That's just cool. Um, and then I've got some rules here for how to fill it out, but this is no big deal for a good lawyer, a good immigration lawyer. It's going to you know, be pretty straightforward. Um, USCIS will send a receipt notice and they will, of course, send an approval notice, and they're very fast on these, really super fast. RFEs, NOIDs, short deadlines, the usual thing. Um, you do see these if USCIS identifies an issue. I have not ever had one that I've submitted, but I hear that they sent them out, and I have copies of some of them from other the people sent me after they got them. OK, so. <clears throat> Com application, USCS petition. If you're in the US, and this is probably the most common one you're going to run into these days, you're handling somebody who's inside the US. So you're going to do the com letter. Once you get that, you're going to file the USCS petition by email. Then you're going to get approved really quick. And then you're going to file your 485. Now, ordinarily, lawyers think the 485 is no big deal um, in most cases, because you got the I-360 approved, right? What could be challenging in the 485? Well, with Afghan cases, there's a whole bunch of landmines in the 485. Um, the trig bars, the terrorism-related grounds of inadmissibility can potentially apply. So you do want people to read the 485 carefully. More than 80 questions on it. They have to be answered truthfully. By no means do you want the applicants for SIV to go down all the questions and just check no, 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 no to everything. There are a whole bunch of questions on the 485 that require an SIV applicant to check yes. Okay, one of them is, have you ever had any military training of any kind? Have you ever had any weapons training of any kind? Um, have you ever fought against a government? <laughs> you know, um, Have you ever been involved in sabotage, hijacking, oh. terrorism, assassination, um, but my favorite one, use of a weapon or explosive to harm another individual or cause substantial damage to property. Okay, well, guess what? You were a security person for US convoys or you carried a weapon next to US soldiers because you were an interpreter and you fired your weapon in combat. Uh, well, you used a weapon to harm, potentially harm another individual and cause substantial damage to property. You also used you worked with an organization that tries to kill people. It's called the United States Army. Now it is lawful under the law of war for people to do this, but you have to put it on the 485 or you're lying, you know? So I tell people just be really, really careful. This is where immigration lawyers really need to get involved because the trig grounds are tricky. And of course, lawfully engaging in combat with the United States military should not be a bar to getting your green card, but Trig is super tricky stuff. And you need to, this is where you need to sit down with the client and go through everything and find out what their history is. And I haven't had a bad experience with USCIS on this when people understand the trig grounds and they answer the questions truthfully. But I have had bad experiences when people just went mechanically no, 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 no to all the questions when it's clear that, you know, the whole basis for their application is they were working with the US military. So I wanted to, to echo that sentiment, uh, Margaret. Um, I've done a few um, adjustment of status uh, for this particular cases. 
Um, I took them on low bono just to cover the cost of what the time was, but um, some practitioners or some organizations have been saying, oh, if you got the 360, the I-45 is straightforward, you can do it. I wholeheartedly echo your sentiment that the I-45 has to be done very, very, very carefully. Um, in some cases, I did them pro bono when I could. Um, if you are seeing the 360s approved and the person is calling you and says, oh, it's just the I-45, uh, you do want to have that conversation because like Margaret said, if you answer it straightforward, the interview will go you know, better than if you say no, 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 because then not only are you adding the layer of those um, inadmissibilities, but also possibly fraud and misrepresentation. So it's very, very important that I wholeheartedly advocate that nobody file the I-45s on their own, at least have an attorney uh, review it with them. Yeah, and somebody just asked in the chat if you killed somebody. Okay, well, first of all, I wouldn't say that you've killed somebody unless you're absolutely sure that you personally killed somebody. Um, having been in the US military, I know when people are in combat, they usually fire their weapons wildly in one direction and nobody's absolutely sure who killed different people. Um, so I wouldn't be admitting to killing anybody unless you absolutely are sure that you killed somebody. Um, but if you did, the answer if you were fighting with the US military was that you were engaged in lawful combat against a hostile foreign force and you were authorized under the international law of war to engage in combat. So it's not illegal. It's not a homicide, you know, it's considered a lawful killing. So you just and, have to and, have a simple sentence that you were in combat with the United States military, you know, yeah, fighting and, alongside the US military. And for those who think like, you know, these Afghans were paroled in, therefore USCIS may be more supportive or sympathetic. Um, I think that's a false narrative. Um, yeah. They are scrutinizing these cases quite, quite deeply. So just, just be aware of that. They are because they don't want to be the headline that somebody got approved for a green card who turned out to be a terrorist who blew things, blew up Americans in Afghanistan. You know, that's what they're really terrified about. So, um, you know, you, you all remember what happened with the old INS that got dissolved because it approved visas for dead hijackers. So they don't want that. Okay, overseas, we're almost out of time. In fact, I think we're out of time, right? Um, so I just wanna mention that they, uh, obviously there's an overseas process. A lot of people are still going through that, but you may not be involved in that. You're probably gonna be dealing more with the people in the United States. Okay, just so you know, we have a whole bunch of information here. We don't have a lot of slide, uh, a lot of time to go through all these slides, but I'm gonna give them to you. They're basically a reference. So don't worry about not being able to read all these immediately. One thing I did want to point out is that after the person has an interview overseas, this ugly screen appears frequently and it scares people saying that their visa was refused. I don't know why the State Department does this. It's downright cruel. Um, they only, it says it's been refused until they finish the administrative processing and then it turns to an approval. But it's really upsetting to applicants they go in for the visa interview, nobody told them anything was wrong. And then they log into SEAC and it says refused and nobody gave them any information and nobody said anything about it. Um, if they're actually re being refused for inadmissibility grounds, they're supposed to be given a piece of paper that says that. Okay, so they can't just refuse them without telling them, but the SEAC system is nasty this way and it just says refused while they're undergoing their administrative processing. Okay, so this is what they're supposed to get if they're actually being refused. Um, they do get benefits after they get into the United States, so that's really good. Um, there's a lot of litigation going on. <laughs> I have this on the slide just for you to go check out sometime if you're bored. Um, whoops, sorry. Don't know what happened there. Okay, so I think we're out of time. Is that correct? No, you actually have five more minutes. So we um, are skipping our break because this was the one that was shortened for some reason. So you've got five more minutes. Okay, um, I'm gonna go to the chat then. Um, do you recommend preparing an affidavit to submit at the interview? Um, you don't need one. So Margaret, I just wanted to add one of the challenges I saw on the military bases as you were you know, referencing the HR letter, particularly those who are having a hard time getting in contact with their um, it's, it's fairly common that you're going to have a very difficult time finding the person to sign the HR letter and then it, continuing with the, the comm. Um, a person may be very well eligible, but they just can't get the necessary documentation. Uh, unfortunately, the fallback is asylum. Uh, and I saw that on the seven of the eight military bases that I visited, and it's just heartening. But um, 
if you have limited time and you know you've tried every resource to, to help the fellow Afghan evacuee try to apply for asylum, I mean, I'm sorry, for SIV, and you're not able to then, unfortunately, the fallback. One question I often got, um, Margaret, uh, if you want to chime in, my thought was, you know, depending on which one is stronger, people are asking, well, should I apply for SIV or should I apply for asylum or should I apply for both? My answer was, depending on if your SIV is fairly strong, go that route because the asylum process is rigorous. As we're hearing, some of the interviews are taking eight to 10 hours. Again, it's not flying colors that Afghans are going to get through and get it. So if my take is, if you're able to get the SIV, continue with that process. What is your take on that? Yeah, I agree with you. I prefer SIV if the person clearly qualifies. I find it's just much faster. And it's different in different parts of the country. They're supposed to be prioritizing the Afghan cases. But, you know, I, I have a client in Alaska who applied for asylum recently from Afghanistan. We had to fly to San Francisco to do the interview, you know. So if we hadn't been willing to fly to San Francisco to do the interview, she'd be waiting six years for an interview because they just never send anybody to Alaska to do interviews. Um, so it's pretty crazy, and the asylum system is just completely backlogged. I think everybody knows that. Uh, there's also poor quality decision making at some of the asylum offices. Uh, there's nationwide, I think people are aware that different asylum offices have completely different records on whether they grant asylum or not. And there's a couple of notorious asylum offices in the United States that just don't like to grant cases. And you could have the most meritorious case in the world, and they're going to refer it to the immigration court. You know, it's well, just kind of crazy. Next um, time, next time you're in San Francisco, I'll have to get you some Afghan food. You know, Bay Area is the biggest hub for Afghan food. <laughs> I will definitely let, look you up. But yeah. Okay, so I think I think we're out of time. Do you want me to just check the chat really quick? I would just say for those who, who are interested in doing the SIV cases, um, they are time consuming, but I think they're streamlined, especially if the individual's here. Uh, if you've never done SIV, like uh, like Margaret said, IRAP, um, there are a lot of great resources. Uh, Vicina, Vicina, is that what it's called? V-E-C-I-N-A? Yes. They have, uh, L-I-R-S, they all have uh, Human Rights First, they all have great resources. Um, if you're interested in taking on these, because as you get more and more Afghan clients, there are two options are either SIV or asylum, and then very few for through family adjustment. So don't be afraid that once you get a hanging of a couple and you're able to do it, but there are a lot of issues that come up and uh, it's doable. I think it's doable. Yeah, and don't forget, we talked about this earlier, but EB2 national interest waivers are potentially possible also. Um, you need to have, the person needs to have a plan for how they're gonna benefit the United States, but maybe they're gonna keep working for the US government somehow. And that might be an option as well. Um, the fact that you're eligible for an SIV doesn't preclude you from filing an EB2 national interest waiver case also, if you somehow can't document what you need to do to document for the SIV. So that might, might be an option for folks. And the optimistic um, one is the AAA, the Afghan Adjustment Act, which- um, Right, well, that would solve everybody's problems if we could only get that done. But okay, um, I did want to mention that we do have a, a session coming up on how to do asylum cases for Afghanistan. So that's not this session. And we will be referring to the Vicina materials for that one. Uh, Vicina has an online free class for lawyers on how to do an Afghan asylum case. It's really wonderful. Um, and we gave you, we're going to give you the links to that material, or we have given them to you, I think, already. If not, Jim gotten them already, you'll get them. I, I just put the link on there. Okay, great. Thank you. And I had I had a handout with all the Vicina material, but I'm not sure how that was transmitted to the participants. So we're going to be uh, providing all of the documents, links, everything by Monday to all of the participants. So no Great. one needs to worry. Everything will be uploaded and provided. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and just move right along to the next panel if unless anyone needs a break. Everyone good? Everyone's good? All right. Okay, I think our next panel is asylum, right? Our next panel is asylum, and Margaret is again one of our two stars. And our other panelist will be Sharifa. Um, so it's, um, you can go right into it if you need a couple minutes. Um, Sharifa okay, I just wants need to, to start. Pull up, pull up the PowerPoint here, so. Let me just make sure I have it. 
This panel will go until three o'clock um, and then we'll take a 15 minute break and then we will move into our final panel thinking outside of the box and uh, kind of bringing everything together. Okay, so let me go ahead and try to get the PowerPoint here. And if anyone has questions that were not answered during the day, or you just thought of one, uh, we will have all of our, you know, almost all of our panelists will be appearing again at 3.15. So we'll be able to, okay, let me get her in there. there we go. So all of our panelists will be, uh, or almost all of our panelists will be together at 3.15. So you'll be able to ask any questions that you've thought of since the beginning of the day. Okay, so I'm about to pull this up and I'll restore my video as soon as it's up. And Sharifa is now on also. Okay, great. Okay, let me go ahead and share the screen. Is everyone able to see that? Yes, we are. All right, excellent. Okay, these are your two speakers. Sharifa, you're, are you here? I'm oh, here, yes. <laughs> excellent, okay. So we're gonna go back and forth and talk about how to do an Afghan asylum case. Um, and this is kind of what our agenda is. I, will wanna, I did wanna mention that we gave you the Vecina materials as a handout. Um, I also did something that I've never done before for a CLE, but I thought it would be helpful to folks. I sent you the script that the asylum officers use in the asylum interviews, all the questions that they're gonna ask your client. Uh, and I also sent you a redacted script from an actual asylum interview from about three weeks ago in San Francisco. Uh, so basically this is, should be really useful to an attorney. Don't you love to go to trial when you know all the questions that are going to be asked at the trial of your client? Absolutely. You're going to have the best outcome for your client if you do that. So I gave that to, this is the first time I've ever done this at a CLE. I gave everybody the script. It's your magic tool to win these cases. Okay, here we go. Um, references. Um, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services has a page now for Afghan nationals, and it actually talks about asylum and how to apply for asylum. And then HIAS has a pro se um, interview prep toolkit. And then I didn't add Vecina to the slide, but I did provide in the handout their complete set of materials, including the link to their free class for attorneys on how to do an Afghan asylum case. Okay, all right. so. Supposedly, Operation Allies Welcome allows expedited affirmative asylum applications um, where you file your 589, you get your biometrics, and you get your interview, and you're, it's all supposed to happen super fast. Um, I have experienced it being super fast when my clients are willing to fly to San Francisco, but I don't know, Spasmi, do you want to go ahead and talk about your experience? Or sorry, Sharifa, do you want to talk about your experience? Yeah, so um, normally, as uh, many of you know, the asylum system is completely backlogged, and I've had cases where it took between three to five years to get a schedule, uh, an interview scheduled with the Afghan asylum cases, um, because there is expediting um, processing required. We have been successful in getting our cases scheduled um, for an interview within 45 days of filing. Um, and then they are to be issued a decision within 150 days. And they've been at the asylum office um, has been pretty, um, they've been pretty good about keeping this timeline uh, when the, uh, you know, as the cases are getting filed. Um, but you have to make sure that when you do file the cases that they are, that you do annotate that it's an OAW uh, parolee um, asylee. Make sure you make that annotation on it. Yeah, and I, I've heard, I actually haven't had anybody approved yet. I've had people interviewed, but nobody's got a decision yet. I, um, I did. I had actually one. So, woohoo. That was favorable? Did they grant it? Yes. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, out of the New York um, office. I have heard some horror stories out of some offices. Um, I heard a couple of horror stories out of Boston. Um, yeah. And of course, these eight or nine hour interviews and interrogations are happening apparently with some officers, you know, and that kind of indicates they're probably heading in a denial direction. 
if they're gr grilling your client that badly? Uh, I, I I think that a, a lot of that has to do with the fact that they um, have a lot of pressure to get these uh, interviews scheduled in, in such a fast manner that I, I think that they just don't have the, the time to do their due diligence. So the interview is their last chance to basically ask all of their questions and do all of their vetting. Uh, but I think we there's a 98% uh, or nine, it's in the 90s, the approval rate for the Afghan asylum applications. I think there's only been like maybe one denial or so in one NOID issue. Okay. There well, hasn't been many filed though. Granted, there hasn't been many filed yet. Okay. Well, that's good news. Let's just hope it's not like the HP where they approve everything at first and then they go, wait a minute, you know, too many of those people are getting approved. Okay, um, so you can request expedited processing. Um, this is what the rules are for who's allowed to get expedited. Um, but basically anybody who came recently is gonna be allowed to get expedited. Okay, so preparing the client for the interview. This is really important. Um, filling out the, four, the 589, I think most attorneys aren't gonna have too much trouble filling that out, uh, except you gotta tell the truth. I do recommend doing a personal statement a detailed personal statement telling the client's story. It's your chance to make them real to the officer. The officer can presumably read it really quickly in advance of the interview and then focus their questioning. Um, but the interview preparation is really important. And my practice is to at least one week in advance of the interview, you know, this is like getting ready for a mini trial. I do a mock interview. I go over the whole 589 again with the client. I do a hand in changes page. Um, I go over their expectations, logistics for the interview, what to wear, where they're going to meet me, you know, the protocol, what the role of a lawyer is at an interview. I go over the whole script that I gave you, um, and I talk about the, the possible outcomes, um, and then I talk about the mandatory bars to asylum. That's really important to talk about in Afghan cases. Um, so these are some of the things that are going to come up at the interview, the TRIG, Terrorism-Related Inadmissibility Grounds. Have you ever committed acts of terrorism, committed acts that harmed others purposely, been a member of a group that used weapons? Okay, well, the US Army uses weapons. Resided in a part of Afghanistan under Taliban control, interactions with the Taliban. Did you ever go through a checkpoint? Did you ever give them money or supplies? Have you ever attended a Taliban school? Interactions with any groups that use weapons or violence, family members in Afghanistan are working or previously worked for the Taliban run government. Um, so these are things that you have to look at really carefully because they can be denied asylum if they don't answer appropriately to these questions or if they lie about it. Um, and then of course, to be granted asylum, you have to show that you're being persecuted. You have a past persecution or well-founded fear of future persecution on, a one, on account of one of the five grounds. So this has to be explained to the client. You don't get asylum in America just because you say, I don't wanna go back to Afghanistan. You have to show that you qualify for asylum on one or the five grounds. And particular social group, you wanna make sure as an attorney that you've developed your theory about what social group, if you're relying on that. Of course, there's nothing that stops you from applying on all five bases if that client qualifies under all five. So do that for sure. You never know what's gonna ping the interest of a particular asylum officer. Um, so the interview, they're gonna take the biometrics, then they're gonna escort the person to the office. Um, typically the last three digits of their A number, they get sworn in, interpreter gets called. Um, the asylum officer reads a script about what's gonna happen at the interview and then asks a bunch of questions and they're typing all the time, which is disconcerting to a lot of clients. So you do need to tell the clients, you know, this officer is gonna be typing away while you're in, they're not gonna be looking at you you know, that's normal, don't worry about it, you know, slow down if you hear them typing so they can type everything that you said um, and then just pause until they finish typing and then they'll look up again and then you can get going again. Um, so these are important things. Um, I uh, try to look up the asylum officer before the interview if I can figure out who it is, um, bring laptop, take detailed notes. They don't expect you to bring experts um, you can't speak for the client. So you're not, you know, I always explain to the client, my role is like, I'm the coach, but you're running the race here. You know, you're, you're being the one interviewed. So I can interfere in the interview. If I believe it's necessary for due process reasons, like I, you know, it was clear the client didn't understand the question. I can ask it to be rephrased. Um, 
I can advocate for the client to take a break. I can pull documents out and show them to the officer. And sometimes things do go wrong during an interview. Um, so you do, you do wanna feel like you can go to the director of the office or the supervisor if you need to. But taking notes is really important. That's kind of the attorney's key function. Um, and then you can ask to give a closing statement. Highly recommend you do that. It should be an elevator speech, three to five minutes max. Speak slowly because they're gonna be typing it all out and have it available in writing to give to the asylum officer if you can. Just, I just want to point out that I, uh, permission or I, I guess the, the officer, the asylum officer has discretion to allow you to make a closing statement or not. Not all of them will allow you to do that. It's completely in their discretion, but like Margaret said, you should of course advocate for that. I always ask for it at the end of my interviews. Um, yeah, even I've never had them refuse to let me do it. Um, I have. Really? Okay. Uh, I think they're supposed to let you do that. That's part of their script that your lawyer is allowed to make a closing statement. Yeah, I had, I've had, I think twice, um, two times where the officer didn't allow me to make a closing statement. Okay, well, that's irregular. They're supposed to do that, but it may have been a situation where they really had to go to the bathroom badly and they figured they knew about the case and- it Yeah, was yeah, we were, we were over time for sure. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it may not be that they, officially were refusing it was more like um you don't really need to do that counsel because i know this case and you, you gave me your legal brief and you know you don't have to repeat your legal brief to me it's in the file you know kind of thing i can see that i mean some of these interviews i've been in so interviews if that were hours and hours uh, Morgan, no if, yeah if they don't allow you like in my situation then would that be a situation you could escalate to the director you could i would also hand in a, a written statement and demand that it be put in the file and get them to type that to, you know that into the record that you gave them a written closing statement because they refused to, I, I put stuff in the record. You know, I tell them, I want you to type this into the record. You mm -hmm. refuse to give me a chance to submit a, a closing statement. I'm submitting a written one. I want to make it part of the record. I don't know. I put all kinds of things at the end. I just yeah. did an asylum interview in Houston where I made them put, you know, into the record. The questions you asked were inappropriate and confusing. <laughs> Okay, so I think that's the questions. I know this audience is pretty experienced at asylum. So I think the really key thing here is you gotta assume these are not necessarily gonna be rollover cases, even though they should obviously be granting asylum to anyone from Afghanistan right now. Um, there's a few points that I wanted to raise from my experience. Um, so one thing you, if you are gonna represent Afghan clients um, in these asylum cases, please just make sure you reiterate to them that they um, that it's a very informal setting. It's not a court. Sometimes, you know, when they hear an asylum interview, they automatically think that they, you know, like it's a very formal setting. It's a courtroom setting and they get very stressed out about it. So I always just, you know, emphasize to them that it's like a very informal setting. It's an office. You're getting interviewed by an officer. Um, but I do also reiterate to them that make sure if you don't understand a question, don't, mis don't make any misrepresentations. Ask the officer to repeat it. Um, don't lie during the interview, don't submit any fraudulent documentations. There is this trend of submitting threat statements and some people, um, unfortunately in the community, um, had uh, decided that it was okay to draft fake threat statements. Um, so just make sure you re reiterate that to your client to not submit any fraudulent documents because a lot of them do have good asylum cases. They have just, they just are under a lot of pressure from other people in the community and from other people that have previously filed for asylum, um, giving them all sorts of advice in, in terms of what to file. Um, so that's one thing I always tell my clients, I'm like, don't lie, don't submit any fraudulent documentations. You guys have, all of you have good cases. Just tell me the truth and I will formulate your asylum case. Um, the other thing, Margaret, that I wanted to point out is that um, the asylum office, they give, they provide their own interpretation, interpreters, as many of you know. Um, with the Afghans, um, there's different dialects, even with like Pashto and with Dari, there's different dialects. So I had in cases where I had like they, the, my client was Dari speaking, but they had a Persian, Iranian speaking interpreter. And me as a, as a native, like, you, you know, speaker from Afghanistan, I had a hard time understanding the interpreter, let alone my client. So at that point I had to interject and, and, and ask for a different interpreter. And the same goes with the, um, with the interpreters who speak Pashto. There's like, you know, um, there's different Pashto dialects within Afghanistan, depending on which part of Afghanistan you're from. So just make sure you reiterate to your client that if you, they do not understand the interpreter very well, that they can ask for uh, another interpreter. 
Um, I had one interview where we switched the interpreter like three times because we couldn't understand them. So that's very, very important. Yeah, so I would also echo what Sharifa said about uh, making sure people aren't lying. It, it's, it's kind of sad to me that rumors get spread in a community that you're not gonna be granted asylum if you tell the truth about your story. So you have to make up some other story that worked for somebody else. Uh, this has been a common theme, not just among Afghans, but you know, I used to run into this with Chinese asylum applicants. Um, I had a horrible case recently where a Chinese asylum applicant who is a Uyghur from China, Muslim, came in to see me because he had filed for asylum claiming to be a Christian because somebody in California told him that was the only way Chinese were going to get granted asylum. You know, so he had filed this completely false application claiming to be a Christian because somebody got the rumor going that, you know, that was the only way Chinese were granted asylum. And of course, he had a wonderful asylum case if he had only told the truth. But his, he had been with a lawyer too, and the lawyer had advised him of this, that, you know, he should file this completely made up asylum claim. So I deal with that at the beginning. That's one of the reasons why I do a mock interview. And one of the reasons why I spend a lot of time with clients when I'm preparing an asylum application, just telling them stories about other people that did bad things. And you don't want to be, you don't want to be that person. Um, and typically they understand, I make, I spend a lot of time on that. Um, and I make sure they understand that it's really important to tell the truth in the interview. And we do the mock interview just to show them what it's like. You know, we sit in an office just like it's an asylum office and we have somebody play the lawyer and somebody play the asylum officer and just ask them the questions. Um, and I think that reassures a lot of people because then when they go into the actual asylum interview, they know exactly what to expect because they've, they've done it before um, in the mock interview. Uh, but telling them stories about other people that did bad things, I think is more effective than just lecturing mm -hmm. people about telling the truth, um, you know, because it's cultural too. And sometimes people are just trying to make the authority figure happy. So they think that they're supposed to agree with the authority figure, or they think they're supposed to say yes when, you know, they're just agreeing that they heard the authority figure. Um, and they're also very, very anxious to please, which can lead to people saying things that aren't true because they're anxious to please, you know. So I give them examples of that and I tell them, you know, you, you're, this interview is really important. This is your life on the line. You don't want to be anxious to please this officer. You just want to say what's true. And if you can't remember something, you need to say, I can't remember. If you forgot something, you can say, I forgot. If the officer asks you something and you can prove it in the documents, but you don't remember it, you can say, officer, can I look at my passport? I don't remember the day that I entered the U.S., but it's in my passport. Can I look at my passport? Um, I find most of the time asylum officers are pretty friendly, you know, most of the time. Um, so it, that part of it is reassuring to people and practicing does help. Do you want to go to the questions? Sure. Okay. One of Okay, so we had a very good question. Cynthia asked, um, if the asylum office denies and the case is referred, any advice in the court process, any trends you are seeing? Okay, so we can talk about this for a while. Um, so if the case is, officially they say it's not denied, you know, we don't deny cases, the asylum officer says. We just refer them to the immigration court. Okay, well, as a practical matter, if you're referred, that means they denied your case. I mean, they said, no, you know, we're not granting you asylum. So what will happen is you'll get a document that's a referral notice, and it will explain to some extent what happened, what the officer thought was the problem to some extent. You know, you missed the one-year filing deadline, or you didn't show a credible fear of future persecution, or, you know, whatever it says. And it will be accompanied by a notice to appear before an immigration court. Um, I'm still seeing fake dates in the NTAs because of the Supreme Court decision that said they have to put a date in the NTA. So that it'll have a hearing date, but oftentimes it's a fake hearing date where they're not really, there's no real court hearing that day or the NTA actually hasn't been filed with the court yet. So there's actually, the court has no idea that there's a hearing that day. So when you get the NTA, you wanna look at it carefully, calendar the hearing date, go online on the EOIR website and check whether your client really has a hearing on that date because there's a pretty good chance that's not a real date and there's no hearing that day. And they just put that on there to comply with the Supreme Court decision that said they have to put dates on NTAs. 
Um, occasionally, still, I'm seeing TBD, but that's not a proper NTA to, put, to be determined as the date of the hearing. Um, if you do get one of those, though, you just want to keep monitoring the EOI or website and keep a, keep an eye on the clock running for cancellation or removal because your client will be eligible for cancellation or removal someday, and you'll be able to um, use that TBD as proof that you can reopen and get cancellation. Uh, so anyway, keep an eye on the date. And then the weird trend that's happening right now is the um, OPLA memo, the Doyle memo came out that's telling uh, the government trial attorneys that they can just dismiss cases if they feel like it in the interest of prosecutorial discretion. Uh, and this is a trend worth spending a few minutes on. So if you have an asylum case that's been referred to court, you probably want to go forward with the case. You probably don't want it dismissed. If it's an Afghanistan asylum case, there's probably a pretty good chance a judge is going to grant it. Now, of course, some of this depends on what jurisdiction you're in, I, but I think I'm talking to Maryland folks mostly, so you're probably not practicing in Atlanta, you know, the worst immigration court in the country for asylum cases. Uh, but what, what you want to do is once a case gets filed with the court, figure out who your judge is. You can go online and analyze the judge's grant rate for asylum cases. Um, TRAC has a spreadsheet of all the judges in the country and how they grant cases and deny cases and what their track record is. If you got a good judge, you probably want to go. Want to you probably will want to go forward with your asylum case and just try it because you're likely to get granted. Um, if you got a bad judge, you might want to have a different strategy. Right now, uh, different offices around the country, the trial attorneys are just filing motions to dismiss cases, even asylum cases. Now, I've, I'm hearing diverging information on this. Some parts of the country they're saying, "Oh, we're doing mass dismissals of cases, but not asylum cases." Some parts of the country, they're doing mass dismissals without regard to what kind of case it is. So if it's an asylum case, they'll move to dismiss, motion to dismiss in the grounds of prosecutorial discretion. I recommend that you be proactive depending on where you're at. Okay, so I what I do is reach out to the trial attorney before they file the motion to dismiss. And I say, I understand you're under pressure, you know, you've got this OPAL memo that came out and you're supposed to be looking at cases and considering which ones need to get off the docket. Um, I either want my case heard or I will agree to a motion to dismiss if I get a remand back to the asylum office for a new interview. And I have successfully done that where I reached out to the trial attorney proactively. I said, I know you want to dismiss the case. And they said, yes, we do. And I said, well, my client really needs a hearing with the judge, but as an alternative, I'll agree to dismissal, but I want to remand back to the asylum office for a new interview with a different asylum officer. Um, and they've agreed to that. And then I got a remand and I got within a couple of weeks, a really nice asylum officer that was totally different from the previous one who did a really nice interview. And, you know, I think I'm going to get the case granted. This only happened recently, of course, so I don't know for sure, but, um, you know, you can do that. And that way, if they do refer it again, you know, you get another chance, another crack at the judge. Uh, but I think those are some of the options that are open to you now with this new PD memo. And that also preserves, if you do a remand, you don't have to refile the asylum application. If they just summarily dismiss your case, your asylum application at that point is going to be dead if you don't have a remand. So you're going to have to refile your asylum application all over again, which will restart the clock on the EAD. And that's a nightmare for clients. Uh, you also have to file a new application not with the lockbox, but with that special asylum unit in Georgia that handles problem cases, because the lockbox will reject your application since they see that you've already filed one and it got referred to court. And they're gonna say, you're not eligible to file for asylum again. Well, guess what? You are eligible to file again, but you have to go to the special unit and file with them instead of filing with the regular procedure with the lockbox. So Sharifa, did you wanna weigh in on that? I think I covered. Yeah. Um... I wanted to also mention, so for the Afghans, because they have TPS for two years, if they, uh, because their cases are getting scheduled in an expedited manner within like six, you know, in, in like two months, less than two months, um, chances are that they're still in status when they do go to the interview. If they're not getting a grant, they're not necessarily getting referred to the immigration court. They just, they'll just be, they'll just, I guess, get deferred back to their TPS, stat, um, to their uh, parole status for two years. Right, and that's a good point. I forgot to mention TPS. So now that TPS has been announced, if they're in proceedings, 
um, you're allowed to administratively close while they have TPS. So you want to file a TPS application and then notify the court. So, you know, you're going to have to, as an attorney, figure out what's best for your client. It might be better for them to be granted asylum. You know, that's better than TPS. Um, so you might want to push to go get a hearing. Um, and then the other option, I didn't really talk about this, but I just had this happen in a case. I called the trial attorney. I said, you know, I know you guys want this case dismissed. I don't want it dismissed. How about we stipulate to asylum? And the trial attorney said, oh, great idea, Ms. Stock. Why don't you draw up a short motion, very short, saying that we're going to stipulate to asylum? And I need a very short sworn statement from your client saying that everything in the asylum application is true attached to the motion. A joint, we'll do a joint motion. So I drafted this two-page joint motion basically saying, you know, the government, DHS and I stipulate to asylum for this principal and spouse and kids. Um, and he's passed all his biometrics. DHS attorney confirmed to me that he had. And, you know, there's no reason for the court to hold a hearing because the government agrees. Um, and we just filed that with the court. It took, you know, maybe like 15 minutes to do this. And they stipulated that they would agree to a grant of asylum by the judge. Um, so that's an option too, you know. And I think now is the time to strike if you're asking for a stipulated asylum because they have a Doyle memo that says they can do that. Previously, they were not willing to stipulate to asylum in most cases, even though you know it would seem logical if the person's eligible. Why don't? Why wouldn't the government do that? But I just had that happen in a case like this week. So I think that's probably the best strategy, Margaret. Then to is if you are in a situation like that, the first uh, thing to ask for would be a stipulation to asylum, and if not, then a remand back to USCIS to the asylum office. Right. Yep. Yep. Um, if anybody needs my sample motion too, by the way, just email me and I'll redact one and send it to you. Um, okay, so chat, is there a humanitarian asylum route that with like with FGM that isn't dependent on well-founded fear of persecution? Yeah, there's um, humanitarian asylum. Um, however, you do have to have, you know, you have to meet the requirements for asylum. So it's not just fear of returning to a new regime. You have to, you know, argue somehow that you've suffered past persecution. I mean, FGM was based on the fact that at one point this terribly traumatic experience happened to the person and for that reason they should be granted asylum, even though once FGM is done, they can't do it to you again. So it's not well-founded for your persecu future persecution. Remember, it's past persecution or a well-founded fear of future persecution. So there is something called humanitarian asylum um, that is more focused on what happened to you in the past and that being so traumatic that the U.S. should give you refuge. But it's more than just having a fear of returning to a new regime. I don't think that would be enough to be to make out an asylum claim. So you would have to show some kind of past horrible traumatic experience. Um, but I think pretty much everybody from Afghanistan should be able to meet that standard. Uh, I can't think of anybody that wouldn't unless they haven't been living in Afghanistan. Maybe they're a wealthy person that was attending private school in Switzerland or something, and they have absolutely nothing's ever happened to them in their life, but almost every Afghan should qualify for asylum. Uh, and then uh, Claudia had a question about evidence of persecution. So normally I submit a pretty thick packet. Um, 589 detail, detailed personal statement, and then I have the usual docs, um, passport, Tazkara, medical records, if there are any police records. Um, I go out and dig up news articles about people that they tell me about. Um, a recent case that I had involved somebody who had been a high school exchange student in the U.S. years ago, and so I went and found the news article about her being in Iowa in a high school exchange program, and she was in, featured in the local newspaper. You know, So I dig up all the usual things to validate the case. Um, I personally don't like filing a case with just a 589 and a personal statement. I think you wanna put more into the packet. And then I usually do a, a short legal brief laying out the social group and the basis for the asylum and, what the standard is, you know, I don't think that the asylum office necessarily needs that, but it helps my client understand what, where we're going and um, it helps me prepare the case and get ready for my closing argument. Yeah, I, I just want to add to that, uh, that I, I I think the personal statement is that the, the piece of evidence that I spent the most time in and I make, I mean, I, I help my clients draft a personal statement and it's very, very detailed um, because uh, essentially what's going to be 
like the interview is going to focus around the personal statement. And um, during the interview preparation phase, I go over the personal statement with the client again, just to refresh their memory. Um, but medical records, police records, yeah, anything like that, anything that can corroborate their story. And every, I try to, the, the way I describe it to the client, I'm like every statement that we make in the personal statement, if we can corroborate it with outside evidence, with any other kind of evidence, such as medical records, police records, we're going to, we're going to file that. Um, and other than that, other than those documents that you've listed, Claudia, I uh, also um, submit affidavits from other family members. Like for instance, we have people that were um, able to escape in the evacuation and they have remaining family members in Afghanistan. Um, I can, I try to get affidavits from them if the Taliban have shown up to their house looking specifically for this person or have searched their house. Um, I get a, a sworn statement from their family members. That's always helpful in the case as well. And like I Margaret think, said, a lot of country conditions stuff. There's so much information out there now in country conditions. Yeah, and the AILA, AILA has the Afghan evacuation list and every couple of weeks, somebody posts a whole list of supporting articles about country conditions in Afghanistan. So if you're on that list, you can get that supporting materials really easily. Somebody's compiling it, really nice person. <laughs> I don't remember who does it, but it's a really great resource. Um, I did wanna talk briefly about the personal statement because I had a horrible experience recently with a client who had been represented by a series of attorneys. One of them was actually in the Maryland area, but is not on this call today. And this um, person had just a really bad experience. So let me tell you what happened. So this won't happen to you. So the attorney told the client to draft a personal statement. Okay. And that's fine. In fact, it's a really good practice to have the client, if they're capable of doing it, draft the first personal statement, you know, the first version of it. Um, if they're capable, you, you know, they can sit down and type it up or handwrite it up or whatever. And the reason for them to do the first one is because you don't want to be accused of having fed a canned story to a client. Um, you don't want to put ideas in a client's head that aren't true. You want to hear their story and you want their voice to come through in the statement as well. And if they write the first draft, you're going to have their voice coming through. The lawyer's role is not to feed the client a story. The client should be telling the story, not the lawyer. Um, however, the lawyer does need to go over the personal statement and fix it, you know, and check for inconsistencies and double check every fact in the personal statement to make sure that it's correct. Um, so let me tell you what happened to this client, this poor client, um, and it, it wasn't an Afghan person, but it's a person from Cameroon. So this person had a very, very good asylum claim, and the lawyer who was from Maryland said, go draft your personal statement. And the client who had a head injury and PTSD and signs of torture and everything went to some FedEx office and typed up a statement. It was full of typos. It had wrong information, wrong sentences, and the lawyer just put it into the file and never edited it. And a second lawyer got involved in the case and just put it into the file for the individual calendar hearing and never edited it or anything. And then at the beginning of the hearing, the judge asked, is everything true in your application? Do you have any corrections to make? And the lawyer said, we don't have any corrections. The client, we're gonna have the client swear to everything's true in the application. We're gonna to get to you know, the personal statement later. Um, and so the judge had the client swear that everything in the application was true. Okay, at that point, the individual hearing went completely to hell because it turned out there was a whole bunch of stuff in this misspelled, error-ridden statement that this client had typed up at the FedEx office 10 years before that was not correct. And the judge denied the asylum application on the grounds that the guy had sworn that everything was true in court. And then it came out in the hearing that the personal statement was error-ridden and full of errors. So please do not let that be, be you. It's not anybody on this call. Um, and I'm sure if you're attending this session, you would never do this to a client. But this two lawyers, actually three lawyers in the case had never edited the client's personal statement. They just threw it into the record and, and it was horrible. It was like a two page thing with just typos and wrong names and you know all kinds of things because the client wasn't able to write coherently in English and nobody edited the thing. So that's my one cautionary thing about personal statements. Lawyers should be reviewing them with clients and making sure everything is correct and fixing their spelling and make sure the names are correct. Um, that will save a lot of grief later on.
one thing I did want to mention, Margaret, is um, if you do have um, an asylum case in, uh, in in your client is in removal proceedings and you're considering filing a motion to uh, to terminate or if you're considering filing a motion with your OCC for the Doyle memo, um, you may want to consider you may want to consider the timeline like that it takes to get a hearing, an individual hearing uh, in removal proceedings in immigration court. Um, so some of, I mean, uh, as all of you guys know, major backlog, it, uh, like you, it used to take years before you could get an individual hearing. I think with all the different courts opening up here in this area, things may speed up a bit, uh, but that's something you may want to take into consideration. I mean, of course your client probably wants to get their case resolved as soon as possible. So if the asylum office is the route to go, mm -hmm. um, maybe like Margaret said, that's probably uh, the best option here is to file a motion and, and try to get a remand there. Um, but if, if it's gonna be quicker to get an individual hearing and you know if your client has a strong case, then uh, maybe the best thing would be to keep it in the immigration court. Okay, and then Anshu Karki asked a question about what jurisdiction, but I'm not sure what the question related to. So Anshu, if you wanna type that again. Oh, the dismissal. Um, so that was a Texas case. Uh, Dallas, my case where I talked to the trial attorney and I got a remand, a dismissal with a remand. That was in Dallas. And then the stipulated asylum case was in Portland. But I don't know why you can't do this anywhere in the country. Um, so my general approach with these is to email the trial attorney first, and then they tell me to submit the PD request through their official channels. And I always do that, but I email them first. And then I submit it through PD channels and then I never hear anything. And then I email them again and I say, I did what you told me to do and I've never heard anything. And they go, oh, and they apologize, we'll look at it. And then usually within a day or two, they come back and tell me whether they're gonna to agree to it. And we do this all by email. Um, once in a while, they'll call me on the phone, but usually it's by email. So I don't just submit bare PD requests without telling the trial attorney ahead of time that I'm doing that and then following up on it with the trial attorney afterwards. And if I don't hear from the trial attorney, I jump to their supervisor, which gets their attention. Um, you know, there's like three levels of TAs usually, and I'll, I just go to the, the head of the local OPLA office if I am not getting any response from the TA. Um, okay, somebody wants us to talk about untimely motions to reopen. Um, oh, I love doing that too. Um, this is called a joint motion to reopen. It's also PD. So you contact the trial attorney for that particular jurisdiction. And in that case, if it's like an old case, a lot of mine are really old cases. I contact the top attorney at that office and I say, I want a joint motion to reopen as a form of PD for my client. Here's all the factors. Um, and they usually agree to this. Uh, in fact, I don't think I've had one denied, refused outright. I've had a couple of people that never responded and I had to go ask different people at different times. But you can certainly ask for a joint motion to reopen. You can join, ask for a joint motion to reopen anything at any time. I love doing this. I recently got a joint motion to reopen a case that was at the Fifth Circuit uh, because the client was eligible for cancellation of removal because they gave him a TBD in his original NTA and I had waited out the 10 years and then I asked for a joint motion to reopen and they agreed to that. And then they we filed it with the BIA and the BIA reopened and remanded for a hearing on the cancellation. Um, and then I've done it with in absentia orders from years ago. Um, I usually need some excuse for why they didn't show up for their hearing, but there's almost always a good excuse for that. I was scared. I didn't get the paperwork. I didn't have a lawyer. I didn't understand what was going on. You know, I don't know, but I've had pretty good success on that. In fact, I have sample um, joint motions to reopen that I can share with people. Most of mine are uh, military people related. So military spouses or somebody related to somebody in the military, but I don't see why you couldn't do that with other folks like vulnerable populations, um, especially countries that have TPS now. I'm a big fan of the Doyle memo, okay? I think it gives you the chance to be a real lawyer and negotiate with your opposing counsel for the correct result for the government and for your client.
Um, somebody had a question. Uh, do you submit the entire PD packet? So I submit what they tell me in the local PD guidance. Every OPA office has a guidance for what they want submitted. So with my initial email to the trial attorney, I don't give them everything. I just give them a very short summary. My, my thinking here is lawyers are really busy. Just tell them what they need to know. Don't overwhelm them with information. So I have kind of a sh short paragraph, you know, dear Andrew, I wanna ask for PD for my client. Here's the basic facts. You know, the only negative factor is blah, blah, blah. Would you agree to, you know, and I lay out what I want to agree. And they always reply back with, can you submit to the, you know, ICE PD request line, you know, in accordance with our instructions? And I go, yes, I will do that. So then I go ahead and I follow their instructions exactly and I submit it. And of course, then I never hear anything. So I, after I document that I submitted it, I email the attorney back usually a week or two later and say, hey, I submitted it, but I haven't heard anything. And then they go ahead and look at it. Um, sharing my sample, I can do that. I will send that to the um, the folks who ran, set up the seminar so we can get that shared out. And then uh, somebody has suggestions for how to finesse and who to talk with the motion to rescind an expedited removal order. There's actually a process for that, but it does have to go to CBP if it was at the border. Um, and the ALA had a practice advisory that's pretty old on what to do with expedited removal orders and how to get them hopefully rescinded. And some lawyers have had pretty good luck with that, but uh, I haven't tried it recently. Okay, I think we're almost out of time unless we have other questions. We've got three minutes if anybody has. Oh, there you go. <laughs> please tell me that the new immigrant from okay new immigrant from afghanistan should they go to an attorney to process their asylum case or agents there are agencies that will help them um i i have a little bit of good news on this front although i don't know if it's happening in maryland yet but in my part of the world um, catholic social services received money from the government that Catholic Social Services is allowed to use to pay private attorneys to file Afghan asylum cases. Um, so that helps resolve a dilemma that many immigration lawyers are feeling right now, which is that everybody's asking for pro bono help and you can't afford it because your office is gonna shut down if you try to help all these people because you gotta pay the bills. Um, Catholic Social Services told me that they received a substantial amount of money from the government that they're allowed to use to actually pay a private attorney to file Afghan asylum cases by the one-year deadline. Um, and I don't think I'm allowed to say how much, but it's market competitive rates. Um, and they don't want you to go to the hearing or the interview. They just want you to get the application filed by the one-year deadline. And of course, they're, so what they're doing is taking the clients that come to them and can't find an attorney and they're contracting with the attorney to file an asylum application by the one-year deadline for a flat fee and you uh, negotiate Margaret, the flat fee with them while we're on the topic of the one-year deadline i do want to uh, mention something that um, even though there is a hard deadline for asylum the one-year bar um, USCIS has indicated to us informally through informal channels that they are willing to make an exception uh, for the Afghan parolees who are in parole status for two years. So if you are, if these uh, Afghan refugees, if you if you have come in through um, uh, the Operation Allies Welcome as a parolee and you are paroled in for two years, it's okay if you miss the one year. I mean, we don't encourage that. Of course, as, as, as practitioners of law, we encourage to file within the one year bar, within the one year deadline. But if you do miss it, you can uh, meet the, the exception for that. Um, right, Sharif, and that's a really good point because I, I think for some reason, a rumor got out that there's no exceptions, but there's actually lots of exceptions to the one year filing deadline. And one of them is that you're in lawful status. So if you have two years of parole, I think yeah. you actually have technically have three year. Well, it's probably within a reasonable amount of time at the end of your status. But if your parole expired, you'd probably have a couple months to get your asylum application in before you'd technically be missing the deadline. So there's exceptional circumstances and then there's change circumstances. And one of the exceptional circumstances is you're still in lawful status. You know, you don't have to meet the one year deadline if you, you're in lawful status. 
Um, so keep that in mind too. And then of course, in exceptional circumstances, I couldn't find anybody to help me with my asylum application. And I'm, um, you know, I don't speak English fluently and I can't read and write English. You know, you're allowed to have an exception if you couldn't get help filing it. So I, I'm not surprised to hear them say that, Sharifa, because that's actually the law, you know, mm -hmm. that, but I think people are still anxious to put the issue to bed and they don't want to, you know, just push it They just it off. wanted something in writing from them, yeah. but they were like, no, you, you can file it after the one year bar deadline, but we're not going to issue anything in writing. Right. And TPS also is an exception mm -hmm. too. Uh, Maureen pointed that out. Thanks, Maureen. Um, before we close out, I do want to emphasize um, Arzo, who asked this question. Please, um, if you have, you know, Afghan refugees um, that you're helping or that you know you're assisting, please do in, uh, emphasize to them and encourage, and encourage them to ha to seek the help of an immigration lawyer in filing these asylum applications, um, and don't attempt to file these pro se. Um, it is complicated, and even if you do file the asylum application uh, pro se, the actual asylum interview, like Margaret mentioned, is very, very long. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, the ones that have occurred, ha some of them have taken up to eight hours. So it's essential that an uh, interview, uh, that an accompany, um, that an attorney accompany you to this interview and that it's prepared by um, an attorney. There are a lot of nonprofit legal, uh, legal service providers who are offering assistance. Um, Human Rights First, um, they have um, a whole system of placing, uh, um, uh, placing you with pro bono uh, legal service providers uh, with a pro bono attorney. So reach out to the nonprofits, reach out to your resettlement agency. They may assist you in, in referring you to somebody, uh, but um, please don't try to do this on your own. Um, uh, we are gonna be taking a, another break, but our speakers will all be back at 3.15 on thinking outside the box. So if your question was not answered during one of these panels, you'll be able to, you'll have a second chance and uh, otherwise, we will be back at um, 315. <laughs>